Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you throughout the world. Uh, we have quite a crew uh, here already. Uh, so let me go ahead and get started with, um, with today's event. It is with SAP. I'm thrilled to have them here. It'll be a very interesting one. We've got two top-notch folks from SAP. At least I think they're top-notch. You better live up See. to my billing. <laughs> two great people from SAP. I am thrilled to have you back again. This is the third time. Um, Oh, this is the fourth time, beg your pardon, third time. Third time that you guys have been uh, in front of the BBBT. Uh, we had Jason Rose before and Byron Banks. That was last July, so it's been a little over a year. Uh, so I'm sure there's lots of news that, that uh, you guys are going to give us. The title of their presentation is SAP Analytics and SAP Enterprise Information Management. We have Manny Gill and Ken Pierce, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Ken Pierce is now going to give us the EIM version of, of today's session. So go ahead, Ken. And I'm Ken Pierce. I'm with SAP. I am part of our Enterprise Information Management team. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about information management and what that means for analytics and maybe a little bit about data governance. Analytics is a key piece of that, especially when you're talking about regulatory reporting. The key message to walk away with that I'd like you to understand at the end of the day is just a brief understanding of what SAP is doing today with our customers around information management. And if you walk out of the room with a high level understanding of that, I'll consider it a success. I will be available uh, to take any questions that you have. You're free to send me an email. Uh, we can get you more materials. And at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna show you uh, an iPad app for those of you with iPads that you can download to give you even more information. So when you walk away, uh, you can deep dive, download an app. If you don't have an iPad, we have a PDF format of that as well. And it'll let you dig as deep as you want and go anywhere you want. So today's topic is all about feeding the knowledge worker with the key things here to walk away with are accurate and relevant data. I tell people when it becomes analytics, just because you have data and you're using data to generate reports, it doesn't necessarily mean you're using the right data or accurate data or relevant data. So let me share a story with all of you. There's a very large cheese manufacturer here in Denver, Colorado. And prior to working uh, to SAP, I was doing some consulting. So I got a call from their COO, Paul Adams. And Paul wanted to implement an information governance program. When I was speaking with Paul, I asked him, why, Paul, do you really want me? What's all this about? What's going on? And Paul sits down and he goes, well, let me tell you, Ken. And Paul lives down the road from me. Here's the challenge. I just walked out of a quarterly meeting with my CFO and I did not have accurate data that was up to date to present to him how much revenue we earned this quarter. And so we talked through that a little bit. And I said, well, Paul, tell me, how did you, what did you give to him at the end of the day? And he goes, I wrote it on the back of a napkin based oh. on what I thought <laughs> we made. Mm. <laughs> Now, is that a bad thing? Yes and no. They were implementing SAP ERP. They had implemented all of our FICO pieces of the puzzle. For those of you not familiar with FICO, that's our financial and controlling applications for the entire record to report business process, right? And what they had done is they had an old JDE system up and running. They had just installed ERP with FICO, just installed a BW instance, SAP BW, and they were running reports out of both systems. But they had migrated and moved data from their JDE system into their ERP system. And the data that they moved wasn't accurate and timely and up to date. And it didn't handle the 
historical closed transactions. Now, I know all this because I went in there and did some consulting for them and really dug under the covers. So if you don't have relevant and accurate data, right, or what we call trusted data, all you're doing for your decision makers and your business owners and your C-suite is creating a bunch of village idiots. That's my terminology. <laughs> can I quote and you it, on that? You can. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter how fast you get them the data, right? Which a lot of people, oh, you know, we can do this, we can do that, it's really fast, we can generate reports super fast, right? But like the NBA or the NFL, applications up there, if the data is inaccurate, then you're going to make bad decisions to drive your business. So information management is really about making sure that the information we give to the knowledge workers, the people out in the field today, whether you're a business analyst, a data scientist, whether you're a business process owner, whether you're an IT person, right, information that you can act upon and that you can trust. All right, page one. I'll try to go fast. Once again, uh, the safe harbor statement, which basically says that anything I tell you today, we can change our mind about. <laughs> okay. So uh, Manny gave a different uh, point of view, but basically the same picture here about really what are the big drivers today in information management and they line up with the big drivers in analytics because obviously analytics is one of the key use cases for information management. But we do see one thing as an emerging middle class growing to five billion people. Now why is that so important today? Well how many of you have one of these? Right? How many of you use one of these? Pretty much everybody here in the United States uses a laptop. Right? I have an iPad. Right? Now then why is that important? Mobile devices, a laptop, and an emerging class? Because more and more people have access to more and more devices. And those devices are mobile devices. And you have a higher number of people now participating in a growing social economic class, wanting more data now. Right? We're doing banking data today. And Dave, tell me if I get out of the picture or whatever. I told you, I, I warned him, I walked, so everybody. So in Africa, for example, people don't run around with laptops. They do all their banking transactions on mobile devices, right? Because they don't trust banks historically. But they trust their cell phones. But their economic basis is growing up and up and up and up. So they're doing more and more and more with more and more devices, right? We know, therefore, that mobile devices, we have more mobile devices today than people. How many people in this room, it's hard to say on the camera, have more than one mobile device? Everybody in here, <laughs> right? How many people have more than one toothbrush? Ew. <laughs> I have two. One for travel, right? Oh, and that's one true. For home, right? That's true. Okay. You have three. three, okay. I have one for travel and I have one at home. Right. <laughs> but I have right, five, I personally, I have five mobile devices if you wow. talk about my laptop, right? Yeah, that's true. Think about it. Yep. Right? There are more mobile devices than there are people today. Not only that, but we see that there are 15 billion web enabled devices. Things like refrigerators, stoves, smart meters from utility companies, right? I actually have a smart meter now in Arvada, which is down the road, as most of you know, on my water meter. How many, anybody else have that? That's this new Denver water thing, putting a smart meter on my water consumption. So they can bill me more when I water my lawn too much, right? Think about that. Then we got the one billion people on Facebook, one seventh of the world population. Now the interesting thing about this is getting back to the relevant data. So 
Facebook is great. I'll give you an example. I was in New York City a couple, three weeks ago, and I walked in, got onto Facebook, I landed, and I checked in at the hotel, and I checked in on Facebook. Said, I'm in New York City at the Marriott. Now, why was that great? What was relevant about that? Well, my buddy from Denmark, from Copenhagen, you know, I hadn't talked to probably six months, was in New York City at the same time. And that was relevant for me because the two of us got together and had dinner. Now, Ronnie, took, is his name, my friend, took a picture of his dinner that we had and shared it with everybody. But was that relevant for Ronnie? For Ronnie, it was relevant. For me, that was irrelevant information. I don't care what he had. But for the oyster bar, was that a good thing? Where we were eating at, the oyster bar is a very old, famous restaurant in New York City in Grand Central Station. Well, that was great for them because now they know somebody that had this dinner at this time on this date who's from this country and that appealed to them. But I didn't care if you had trout. So really we're getting back to having the information that's integrated across whatever source you have from whatever data type that you're talking about, right? Whether it's master data, transactional data, analytical data, structured data, right? Any type of data, operational data that you're running with, security and audit data. A lot of people don't think about that. Compliance data, right? We see a huge uptake in regulatory compliance. I was in New York that same week when we were talking about New York City, I was talking to banks about the ability to do regulatory compliance fulfillment based on bank data from multiple systems, systems loans, transactional systems, uh, trading systems, credit systems, right? Everything required for Basel III, which is a a worldwide banking uh, set of regulations, all dry, driven around having the right data at the right time to make sure that banks are liquid enough, have enough capital so that we avoid the 2008 crisis again, right? Everything around risk management for a bank. And they have to, all the big banks have to turn around every year do this huge analytics assignment and submit that to the FDIC to say that they can stay in business. So any bank with over 50 billion in assets. So when you start to think about that, you know, do they have enough capital on hand that they can be liquid enough so if there is a crisis, we don't have a Lehman's Brothers. So they have to pull all this data all over the place and then use our wonderful BI tools, right, to give that kind of analysis. But one of the struggles that we see today, or several of the struggles, is that according to Gartner, I'm sorry to quote them, but 46% of the organizations need better access to data for real-time analysis. So go back to this bank. Now let's say that you're a bank and you're doing interday trading. You're a bank. And you want to know what your liquidity is at the end of the day for your interday, uh, at the end of the day for your, inter for your liquid, let's just say liquidity risk management. I can come up with that today. Because if I don't have enough capital, what do I have to do? I have to borrow from another bank to cover that gap. But what if I have plenty of capital? I get to loan that money out. And that's good, right? Because I make money on loaning money to another bank. I'm secure my liquidity risk. And now I'm making even more money on it because I have excess. But I have to be able to analyze that, right? And I have to be able to analyze that real time. 
Let me ask you a question, because you both have said analyzing stuff real time. Um, are you, let me, let me just put it this way, are you analyzing, all analytics are real time. As soon as I push the button, it's real time. It's gonna run and do its mm -hmm. thing, right? There's a difference, though, between real time analytics and real time data. True. And, and are you talking about doing real time analytics on real time data or on low latency data? From or a real both. time, when I speak to real time, it's when you need it based on the data that is so there. That's not necessarily real time data. That's just, I need an, well, an answer to my question. Based right? on what you have today. But the ability to bring that data in real time and faster, and I'm going to talk about that, right? Shortening that latency time actually gives you now real-time analytics on real-time real -time data. data. Okay. But, so it depends, right? Real-time analytics says, I need analytics today, right now. I need the answer now, right. based on that data set. Right. Then, like you said, the other side of that coin is, is it based on the real-time data that's in the system? Right. In other words, are, are we doing analytics on operational data, or are we doing analytics on a data warehouse, or on some sort and of... And both is what I'll yeah. address. Okay. How you do it okay. with both real-time. And in your case, when yeah, you... Uh, both. It's always both. No, but, okay, uh, I just wanted to clarify a, that. I'll give you a, a, a very tangible example. Um, it's so you create in an example you could create the predictive model, mm -hmm. right, and train that model based on data that on historically historical data, has right. come in. That's where we create the models. Create the model. validating it. We may well, and, and and applying it. And applying it, right? right. So, so the fraud is happening right now. I want exactly. to take this model. I want to be able and to apply it. And, yeah. and take it even a step further, is you can generate the scoring code, right, at, and deploy that even at the ESP layer, which is the, where the data is being streamed from, right? So it's not only catching it where it lands, but it's actually catching it as, at it's, the, as, it, as it's generating the data, right? Right at that point, at that device. Or yes even when that no, transaction is okay. executing. Yeah. Right? It's, it, yeah. As I understand it, you don't have a streaming analytics engine. We do. You do? Yes, absolutely. What do you call it? CEP. It, uh, so we do, we do, it was uh, part of the Asibis acquisition, yes. right? So we have a, an entire streaming platform that's very, very uh, comprehensive. And um, we've tied it into our business objects environment where you can have, for instance, dashboards through this known as Excelsius updating in real time based on that streaming. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're that's welcome. what I, I got the answer to my question. Yeah. So the other problem that we see is the giant problem of, we got all this data sources, but we have a huge data quality problem. And we'll talk about that a little later on. Uh, from an SAP perspective, we actually take a look at information management and having a strategy. Our strategy is threefold. One is to help our clients maximize their operational efficiencies around their business processes. Whether it's an order to cash, quote to cash, if that's what you want to call it, procure to pay, record to report, uh, hire to retire, right, forecast to make, all of those. And all of those key business processes, right, are constantly generating and creating and manipulating data, right? So you might be creating an invoice, right, or a sales order. Right, or you might be doing MRO. From an analytics perspective, we try to help our clients make better decisions by having accurate information, trusted information that they can use no matter where it is. And I'll use a couple of, I'll use an example with T-Mobile here in a few minutes where I'll talk about how they used campaign management and it, uh, as a use case and attacking 21 million customers. The other thing is all about reduce risk. You always want to reduce your business risk, right? And we see a lot of this coming around the key regulatory industries, things like utilities, telco, banks, oil and gas. How can they reduce their risk? Not only from banks from liquidity risk and credit risk, but also from oil and gas for environmental health and safety risk, et cetera. So we see that as a whole use case, right? So let's look at some examples of some of those use cases.
We're going to look at three customer examples. I think I have six, but based on Claudia's request, I'm going to try to get through this a little faster than normal. And I could talk about this forever, too. I'm very passionate about IM. So we look at T-Mobile, 21 million customers. And what they were trying to do is personalize campaigns. Are you guys familiar with personalization, sentiment analysis, and really going after the customer base with a personalized target marketing versus mass marketing, right? And what they had was multiple sources of data to bring together coming across from their stores, from the internet orders, and from their own transactional systems. Right? Just think about three big sources. And of those three big, there's multiple data stores under all that. So what they had to do was to be able to bring all this data together real time. And I mean real time. So therefore, part of the solution was is in one of those data sources, if there was a change, we were able to execute a change data capture and send that into our system, real time. As soon as it happened at the source, going back to Claudia, what you said, we could replicate that change on that record real time, right? And what we did was we integrated data from all these different sources using data services, as well as our Sybase rep server for all the change data capture. We put that in HANA, and we talked a little bit about HANA, and I'll show you what HANA is a little bit, and then in HANA, did all the analytics on top of that. But getting it into HANA was important because it's not just bringing it all together and then you say, here it is, it's in HANA. You have to transform that, align it. It was put into a star schema, right? The data had to be aligned, it had to be cleaned up, right? And then it had to be put into HANA. And then it had to be analyzed and crunched. But what if we put the wrong data in HANA? Right? And what if there was a customer record that was across eight of those different systems for the same customer with different names, different telephone numbers, right? How do I create that one record, the best record possible to do my analysis on? And all those things had to happen to target the campaigns, joining all the data together. Now, why was that important? Because they wanted to know one thing. One thing only. The question was, is how effective are my personalized campaigns? What's my uptake or my take right, on those campaigns? And as you know, customers are constantly executing a gazillion, or not customer, our customers are constantly executing multiple campaigns simultaneously targeted at the same customer. And we all get it, right? And you just delete it. So how do we know what the uptake is? When we look at SAP, here's an example. Uh, from data governance in 2000 and to date, from 2010 to 2013, We've saved $42 million, right, from our data governance, right? Better reporting, higher quality data, better understanding of our customers. We had three mergers, or three acquisitions that we had to merge in. We bought Sybase, Success Factors, we have more than that, and Ariba, those three right, were brought in. Those are big acquisitions. To have a common customer base, we brought in 148,000 customers. Now you think, oh, that's no big deal, it's great, except when you start to think about that from an analytics perspective. And why was that important? I'm gonna share a personal example of that. So one of the things we do at SAP is we try to really understand our customers so we can go after them with target marketing and target sales, right? We want to sell you stuff. Guarantee Manny right now would really love it if all of you bought $2 million worth of software. <laughs> right now? Right now. Sign up for it. If only quarter, I had $2 million, go, million right? I'd do it. 
But the thing is, is you have to have the right customer information. You have to have the right customer contact. You have to have the right customer address. Now think about this. Sybase shows up with their customer base. SAP has our 80,000 customer base. Ariba has their customer base. And all of these have different data models. And now we have to bring all this together. We have to model it. We have to align it with our business processes and with our analytics processes. That's a big effort. So last year at this time, I'm running around. Here's Ken Pierce running around saying, OK, we're going to execute what we call global sales plays. I need to understand the target list that who we're going to go after from a customer so the rep knows what to sell them when in the area of IM. But I had to do it. And at that point in time, we didn't have that common data model. Right? They had holes. They had different categories of data. I mean, the Sybase, you know, you could have probably put everything on Sybase on an Excel spreadsheet today. I guarantee in our, I know for sure, in our SAP system we can't because we actually do it. But within three months, we were able to bring all that data together, enrich it, fill in the missing values based on creating golden records of the best we had from Ariba, SAP, and Sybase. Create those target customers with an entire, how to put this, not just data record, but an enriched data record to create a customer object which could be used both for transactional processing and analytics. That can be used by marketing, by sales, by product development if they wanted to, because we're always out telling you guys our, strategy, our product strategy. When we look at a customer like ICW, a big insurance company in San Diego, here's a unique case. Because what they wanted to be able to do is bring all different type of structured data together, but 80% of their data is unstructured content. And they wanted to be able to link that unstructured content into their business processes, like say invoice processing, something along those lines, right? So when a agent was actually having a conversation with the client, he wasn't calling the client to talk about, well, we have an invoice and a billing problem. He was coming in to talk to them about what other offers he could sell them, right, based on their needs. Now, why was that important? Well, this says three times faster month in close. Yeah, that's fantastic because I've now linked my invoices into my business processes. My business processes, right, are running faster because they're running on top of HANA, an OLTP and an OLAP engine combined together. And I've been able to take unstructured content from all of their policies that they have, pull that unstructured content into a structured format, and do my analysis on that close my books faster, have a better understanding of my customer, and integrate structured and unstructured data. And let me give you another insurance example, and I'll watch the clock a little bit. I was down in South America, and they don't have quite as, they have, let's say, more liberal capabilities in the insurance company than we do here in the United States. So I'm, I'm meeting with the three of the heads of an insurance company. And this company, I uh, can't give you their name, uh, has health, life, and property and casualty insurance, right? So the CEO of health and the CEO of life insurance gave me a use case. And what they said is, we have all these policies out there. And Ken Pierce, you come to me and you're a subscriber to my health, a health care plan, and you want life insurance. Right now, my life insurance and my health care insurance systems are not integrated. I can't pull data together, understand what policies you currently have as it relates to health, dental, vision, everything else, 
nor can I understand what medical treatments you've had. But you want a life insurance policy from me. How do I manage that risk and that payout and be able to charge you, Ken Pierce, the appropriate fees for your life insurance? So by being able to aggregate this data and create golden records, as we call them, around the customer data, both that are health clients and life insurance clients, I can now, as an insurance company, manage my risk of having to pay out life insurance. Because if there's a person over here that has cancer, say Ken Pierce had cancer, and he's having all these treatments, to get life insurance, it's going to cost him a lot more. But if they didn't have visibility into that information across those business units, how do they know the right price to charge that individual and to manage their risk? So we helped them with that. I'm going to skip those. So how do we do that? How do we bring all this together? Well, we have a set of technologies and information management that do several things. One is to integrate the data, which is bringing it together from multiple sources, regardless of the type or regardless of the source. Any source, connect. SAP, non-SAP, bring them together. Once we bring all that data together, we have to, what we do is harmonize, align it, and cleanse it. And not only do we have to do that once, we have to be able to monitor how that data is being cleaned because data is like a car. You can bring it in and you can clean it and make it look really good, but it gets dirty again. <laughs> Let's be honest, it gets bad. <laughs> and we have to clean it again, right? So you have to do data quality. Then we have to manage the data, which is put a set of processes around managing how that data is used and by whom and the workflow processes with that. And we primarily focus that on master data. Why? Because master data is the most important data there is inside of a company. It's the DNA of your organization. You guys familiar with the concept of master data? Customers, products, suppliers, materials, assets, right? Data that doesn't change very often. And when it does get changed, it needs to be accurate, approved, and governed, right? Then we have the tools for associating data, content data. Whether it's coming from Facebook, Twitter, you name it, streaming in, right? Whether it's actual documents, words, or Excel documents, right? Uh, whether it's a PDF type of document, you still have enterprise content management. And then obviously the ability to archive data. Now, people always tell me, well, I don't understand what associate and archive really have to do with analytics. I hear that a lot. How much, how much data do you think is important in content? Unstructured content, rich data. What do you mean by how much? What do you think? Do you think there's a lot of data that might be in a there's certainly in an a unstructured lot of, document? Sure. There's tons of data. Yeah. <laughs> because today, in my opinion, a lot of people are looking at unstructured are looking at structured data to do all their analysis on. Okay, so I'm analyzing against 20% of the information that's out there. I need to take advantage of the other 80%. And in order to take advantage of that other 80%, I need to know what's relevant. I need to know how it aligns to my process. And what would be really good is if I can actually link that unstructured content into the process. Does that make sense? And we give you the ability to do that. When you talk about archiving data and retention management, why is that important? Well, that gets right back down into regulatory compliance, right? I'm not going to keep active data or inact I'm only going to keep active data around for so much for so long. As soon as it becomes inactive and I don't need it anymore, I get to keep it maybe for seven years in my source systems, unless you're Germany and it's 25. And then what do you have to do? You want to get it out of there, right? Because you don't want to continue to spend the hardware cost to store that data that you no longer need. So you archive it off. 
But wait a minute, from an analytics perspective, an auditor comes back in and says, oh, wait a minute, you know, we need to see data from six years ago. Maybe it's an FDA audit for Colgate, who knows. But Colgate only has to keep that data for seven years. That's the law. So you also want to come around and say, it's seven years in one day, what do I want to do with that data? Right? I want to get rid of it. I want to delete it. I want it out of here because it now becomes a liability for me because if I do have that data, I have to turn it over. So you have to manage the life cycle of that data from the time it's created to the time that it's destroyed. Some data can be destroyed and some data cannot. So we bring a set of products together around this that you've heard a little bit about. Uh, we have Sybase Power Designer for enterprise modeling, which allows you to model your data aligned to your business process and to see where that data resides at the source database, right? We have products for integrating data, right? Data services. It allows you to integrate, it allows you to profile, it allows you to clean data. It allows you to transform data. It is our ETL engine and soon to be ELT engine. Ah, there's a shift in the paradigm, right? Because soon, well, we'll talk about that. We want to be able to extract load and then transform. We have our data quality management. Clean the data based on a set of rules and keep it clean and monitor it, right? Monitor the cleanliness of that data against a set of attributes, and I'll show you some of those. We have Information Steward, which is a business tool, which helps the business with their business glossaries, with their metadata, with their business requirements. Every time I show a customer Information Steward, they fall over backwards and go, we need this tomorrow. I was in Hawaii. We showed a demo of this. They were ready to write a check within two hours because it's for the business users. It's not for IT. It's got a beautiful dashboard. A dashboard, wait a minute, that makes me think of analytics, doesn't it? It's actually doing the analysis of the data against a set of rules. That's all it does. It gives you beautiful graphs and trends and timelines, and you could dig down and down and down and down. Right, but that's important. And I got MDG, which is our master data governance for master data management. We have SAP Extended Enterprise Content Management by OpenText, one of our partners. And then we have ILM for archiving your data. I think that's in full screen mode. I have it at the bottom. The other thing about our information management, we get asked this question a lot, and I heard you asked about, do we have best of breed technologies? The answer is yes. In information management, we have best of breed. Not only do we have best of breed, but from a vendor market share, we're number two in the market for data integration and data quality. And we're the fastest growing in the market as well. You can pipe up any time. I mean, you know this topic as much as I do, right? The other thing we find out is, you know, I want to bring to attention, everybody talks about HANA, right? What, what is HANA? And we'll get to that in a little bit. But information management is a core piece of what we call our real-time data platform. So it's not just HANA, our in-memory database platform. And it's more than a database platform. I shouldn't talk about it, right? EIM is the underpinning, and Power Designer is part of EIM, of our real-time data platform. It feeds our Hadoop big data engines, Hive, right? It's part of our Sybase EIM, our streaming tool. Claudia was asking about that a minute ago. Our SQL Anywhere, right? Enterprise Data Warehouses, IQ. It's a columnar database, and we also use it for other things. Uh, our Relational Database, Sybase ASE. <coughs> supporting ERP, Business Warehousing, BI, and mobile and embedded applications. So it, it's actually where you get the data from and the data you can trust. So, the key challenge then becomes, now that I get the data, 
and I know I can use this data, and I can get it from anywhere, and I can put it in any source, how do I turn that information into a strategic asset for analytics, for information governance, and how do I unleash business value from unstructured content? Nobody's really thinking about that. Really, everybody in the ECM space is thinking about how do I manage and store content, right? Not how do I unleash the value of it by getting it integrated into my business process. So let's talk about the analytics piece of the puzzle first. We want to deliver complete, insightful, trust information from any data source. And we do that in three key areas, right? Gain a complete view of your information. That's data integration, any, anywhere, any source. And we want to be able to do real-time replication. Now let me help you with what that means, and I'll give you an example. We were recently working, did a big project with a bank down in Latin America. And they had Salesforce.com as their CRM system. They had some Oracle applications around customer as well. And this bank wanted to understand their customers. And they wanted to create a golden record of their customer. But their customer data was really all over the floor. I mean, you know, it was terrible from a data quality perspective. It couldn't be harmonized, it couldn't be, they couldn't get the two applications to talk together between Salesforce and Oracle, right? They had SAP ERP, which had a whole bunch of other customer information in it as well. But they wanted to get that single view of a customer so they could cross-sell and upsell. So what we were able to do is to bring that data together from those sources sit down with the business users and they used information steward to take a look at that data, create a best record, and then create a master data management system. That's great, except what happens when somebody goes into salesforce.com and changes that record? That means that the system in the back end is no longer what? Accurate. Or it needs to be updated. So through our change data capture, we could trigger immediately when that data changed, put it into a workflow and an approval process and update the master data system, and then syndicate or synchronize that to all the other systems downstream. So therefore, I'm doing it real time. I'm closing the latency gap. No longer does it take you know, 10 days to make sure I have an accurate customer. I'm doing it real time as soon as the data changes. The other key is unprecedented, unprecedented insight from big data. We have this little thing called text data processing inside of data services, which actually allows you to connect into sources like Facebook, Twitter, all right, and pull all that data in and analyze it and use it. We can tie into Hadoop, by the way, with no programming. And then, again, we can do data modeling, data visualization, metadata management. I talked about that, data profiling, know what your data looks like. Manny talked a little bit about that. So now let's talk about HANA, because everybody keeps asking me, well, what does information management have to do with HANA, and why is HANA important? Because you have OLAP. Everybody in here as a BI person knows what OLAP is. I'm not sure how many know what OLTP is, right, which is online transaction processing. So typically what you have is customers have one system for their OLTP, online transaction processing, for all their business processes, right? I'm creating a transaction to, I'm creating a record, I'm process, a, re, a quote, I'm processing an order, I'm fulfilling that order. I'm shipping that order out. I'm tying it into my 3PL system. I'm collecting cash then, payments from whoever placed that order, right? That's the order to cash process at a very high level, right? That's online transaction processing governed with a set of workflow. Now we turn around and we need to analyze data and we use OLAP. So what do we do? We go get that data from our transactional data sources and we bring it all together in a data warehouse so I understand how much money each customer is spending with me, right? 
And then I have to build cubes and everything else out of that. A whole different system. And then we have the ability to accelerate data. I'm putting all this on disk, and some of this stuff is moving up and down in cache and moving in and out, and it's getting faster, but it's still slow. So what we've done with HANA is we've put OLTP and OLAP in one system. So you can do both real time now, right? I don't have those two different sources. I have one system. And now, to make it really fast, what did I do with it? I took it off a disk and put it in memory. So my entire data set sits in memory. So when I do my analysis against that data set, it's a lot faster. So it, let me see if I understand. You're duplicating the data that is stored in the relational side in the in-memory side as well? This goes away. No, no. You've got a database and you've got an in-memory. Yeah, well, we just load it, it into memory. It's not on disk. It is in memory. All of it is. All of it is in memory. Yep, it's in memory. Do you have a, is there a storage engine for that? Like, is it a columnar database or is it a? It's a columnar database, absolutely. Well, wait, yes. there's a difference between in memory and a database. So explain uh, what you're talking no, about. It's a columnar database. It's been implemented in memory. Okay. Memory is just like okay. disk, right? Yep. It's just a storage yep, yep. area. It's in RAM. Your whole data set's a columnar database in RAM. Do you, and do you provide, um, I know it's one of those it depends questions, but is there some guidelines for the compression that you get with your column database? There is, and uh, boy, I don't know that number off the top of my head because I'm not the HANA guru. Uh, do you know the number of HANA compression off the top of your head? I think you prefaced it by it depends on the data and the sparsity of the data. Um, but in a lot of cases, 4x compression. 4x or better. So the other question that I have then um, comes back to the amount of RAM. So is it only in memory or does it page to disk when RAM is not enough and then you get pretty severe performance degradation, wouldn't you? Or is that not a question because you just whack it all in RAM, say buying a big, buy a bigger box? Yeah, you, you buy more RAM. We sell it by RAM, right, by 64 gigabyte blocks. For your RAM, so you just keep buying, and you know, RAM's cheap. Uh, two things to walk away with in this environment, right, is that the data transfer pipe bringing data in is 50 times faster, right? So I can take, and in some cases, when you look at BW and BW extracts, taking BW extracts, SAP BW, and bringing those into HANA is up to 50 times faster or 10 times faster, I'm sorry, not 50. 50% 50 and then 10 times. So why is this important for IM? Well, we gotta bring data into HANA from all these different sources, right? And we, gotta, we use HANA for our transaction and analytic systems. And the key for us is the direction we're moving into is instead of doing the extractions in a staging area and then loading it into HANA. Because of the speed of memory, we're, play, we're changing the game, right? So instead of moving data from 10 sources into a staging area, lining it up, cleaning it up, and getting everything done, and then moving it into my BW system or my enterprise data warehouse where they've manipulated more, or into my transactional systems, right, because I need more data from different sources to create a new transaction. What if I could load that into an in-memory database and then transform it and capitalize on speed? So we changed e ETL, or we are changing ETL as part of our direction, to ELT, extract, load, and then transform the data. 
Yes. But, but it's loading to memory, right? So yep. this is th that's the big difference. You're not putting in a data warehouse. You're, you're not putting, putting in, in a staging area, then yeah. a data warehouse, and then bringing it in, right? It's just boom, bringing it right in there. Is that where your algorithms and your workflow and whatnot works at the transformation level in memory? So that All when that you're write, putting write. it out into the data warehouse, you may have a million columns now. You whatever could, it is, yeah. right? But, but it, it, it's... I hope not it, a million, but you could. <laughs> but, it, but it has made some kind of sense out of that context right. data. Correct. So I spent a lot of time, I covered a lot of this already. So we're, you know, not only are we moving from ETL, text data processing, into HANA to ELT, but we're also processing in Hadoop and Hive which is the bigger data, the big data story, right? So we can retrieve data from HDFS or Hive, either one. Bring it into there and leverage all your big data content. Now remember, this is the analytical engine that Manny was talking about. This is the, I don't want to say engine, that's the wrong word, right? This is, HANA is basically the data platform right, that you're using, that you're running your analytics against. So now I'm fast, I'm accurate, and I'm in one source. All right, the other key thing we see, and we talked a little bit about, is cloud. What are we doing in the cloud? Real-time process integration of data in the cloud. People are moving their processes into the cloud. We talked about Salesforce.com. That's CRM in the cloud, isn't it? Right? But you have to be able to manage your customer data in that cloud, right? SAP has a cloud. All of our applications are being moved into the cloud, including our entire information management suite. We're moving that all into the cloud to give customers software as a service. Information governance with SAP. Why is that important, right? Well, when you are talking to organizations, you see one thing that's really happened being driven by the CRO. You guys familiar with the CRO, Chief Risk Officer? Mm. Off, sometimes the COO will take on that responsibility, sometimes the CFO will. With the re regulatory requirements that are now being put on businesses, I don't know if you guys seen Basel II or Basel III for banks, 23 pages of data quality requirements. Good. Every bank has to implement those. <laughs> Good. <laughs> right? Because they don't trust. They're telling the bank, the FDIC and all the other regulatory bodies around the world for banks are telling them, we don't trust what you're giving us from an analytical perspective. You don't know your data. You don't know what you're doing. So all these reports to us, we don't believe them. They're useless. 2008 came along and none of you could tell us what your liquidity was, what your credit scores were right, what your trading risk was. The entire risk management portfolio for a banks were in the toilet. Banks, do you know banks have to comply with HIPAA regulations? Do you know most banks don't know they had to do that until 2012? You see, here it becomes easy. I'll give you an example. Ken Pierce has insurance, right? I pay for a medical transaction at a Vista Hospital in Louisville. I do an electronics funds transfer. That just went under the HIPAA guidelines. Hmm. And so it's getting very complex. But not only that, when you look at the oil and gas industry, what are they faced with? I went to British Petroleum. Environmental health and safety requirements after the Gulf spill, Right? If you did not hold on to the rail as you walked up the stairs, they actually had people in stairwells to watch this. They would escort you out of the building. You had to back your car into the parking spot. Into the parking spot. You couldn't pull in forward. It now has to be backed in. This is a corporate headquarters. <laughs> environmental health and safety. And you're like, holy crap. So how is and that environmental safety? It. Don't ask me. It. That's okay. part of the EHS requirements that they implemented. Okay. 
because I was like, holy mackerel, are you kidding? Right? Somebody always has to walk with you if you're a visitor at all times. You go to the bathroom, they have to stand in the bathroom and wait for you. Ew. <laughs> I know. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. Is it? Yeah. Do they stand in the bathroom? They weren't that way when I was there. Yeah. yeah really? So the, those are some of the things that are driving uh, regulatory requirements that are driving information governance. Then you also have accurate analytics, right? We already talked about they don't trust the analytics. Then you have process efficiencies. So I was working with a bank, a, a Department of Defense company uh, in the Nordics recently, an armory. They had 3,000 stalled transactions. Now, I don't like to use this example, but I will because it's kind of funny. Now, I'll save that till later. But imagine that a submarine's been offshore, pulls up, and has to restock. And the transaction to order more toilet paper is stuck. And that submarine has to turn around and go offshore for another six months. <coughs> and there's not enough toilet paper in inventory because they're doing just-in-time inventory to save cost. Problem, right? Something that simple. And people don't think of it that way, right? So the ability to govern that data, govern the transactions, from improving business process efficiency to better insight and having the validity of the information available is important. So when we look at information governance, what we want to be able to do is govern information in the process. And that means that we have to be able to bring information to the business process and take information from one business process to another business process. And why do I use the word information and not data, right? Because the difference, in my opinion, between data and information is information is data in context, right, fit for use. And when I look at this, and I want you to think about this from a business process perspective, in SAP world, you have suppliers. Suppliers sell you materials, right? And those suppliers bring materials from all over the place. And you use those materials to create finished goods, your products. Right? It could be semi-finished goods, work in process, packaging. But ultimately, you want to get to the product that you're selling, a finished good, right? So now I'm buying materials. That's part of my procure to pay process. Right? But I need those materials in my forecast to make process, right? Where I produce, I make my finished good. Well, that material has data associated with it, that material object. And that data is shared among multiple business processes. But not only is the data shared, you have to create from that data, right? So when I look at buying from a supplier, I look at things like I'm going to buy 15,000 widgets at $1.95 per widget. But when I look at what it takes for me, those widgets together, I need 75,000 of those widgets to create 10,000 of my finished goods, right? I have to start looking at this information in two different perspectives. One is cost planning on what I'm buying from the supplier, and the other is my production planning on what it's costing me to make my finished good. Now here's the interesting thing. As analysts, you probably know this. How many decimal points do I use for production planning versus cost planning? And how do I align my cost planning and my production planning when I create that report and how do I address the mismatch now between production planning and costing. Do you just drop the decimal places? Well, you can't really do that, right? <laughs> 
because in production planning, you're probably going to go to five decimal points because that's where you need the information on what it's costing you to create that product. Did that make sense? All right. So the information is flowing from my material data through my suppliers to my production planning to storing those finished goods in my warehouse to my 3PL, third party logistics company, right? Shipping it out into the retailer who's selling my finished good, who's buying it from my customer. And I need to know what products my customer is buying real time so that I could do what? Right? Increase production. But in order to increase production, what do I have to do? I have to buy more materials. Now, do I want to buy all the materials or do I just want to buy the materials that are selling? And I want to reuse materials that are not, that I have through a different VAT process, right? One simple process, so much data complexity. So I have to bring it all together. Not only that, but I have to trust that the accuracy of that data for that transaction to complete is valid. Otherwise, I end up with stall transactions. So one of the things that we have the ability to do is within our tools, is our data quality tools, is what we call our data quality financial impact analysis. So this is hard to see for those of you that aren't using on this on the scorecard, but I can take a look at data and I can take a look at it from different dimensions of data quality, accuracy, completeness, and you get to define these, right? Conformity to rules, and there's about 18 that you get to define, you know, on your own based against your data set. Now that's important for analytics, right? But if we can find where there are problems with data and we can increase our data quality, right? we know that our impact for bad data drops. But if it's at $4.09 million, based on the ROI analysis that we did, we can do what if scenarios to say, well, what if we increase the accuracy, right? We can play with this sliding bar any way we want to change these numbers so we then know what area to go focus on. If completeness is lacking because we need to enrich data and by improving our completeness score by 10%, that may be more productive, right, than having it conform to all of our business rules. Now, now that's an analytical dashboard, isn't it? <laughs> You know, if I could real quick, and I know we're fighting the clock, so I'll make it short. Um, <clears throat> doesn't that go back to the question that we kind of led into that the ongoing debate has been uh, putting these tools in the hands of the ultimate decision maker? It isn't what you're addressing here is as long as you have a governance plan yes. and the rules around it, you can minimize the impact right. because you may be 10% off, but you're not going to be on the other side of 50, 60, 70, Well, hopefully, 80. if you have a governance and plan. I'm sorry, for those that couldn't hear, the question was is, going back to our earlier conversation, doesn't this relate to having a governance plan in place such that you have a set of rules that the end user is able to, um, forget your exact term there, uh, manipulate. Yeah. Yeah, work with the data in the dashboard. Work right? with the data and the dashboard so they know what to do. And the answer is this tool is designed for data stewards, right? People who understand the data, who are part of your data governance organization, right? And it's, this isn't an IT tool. This is a business tool. IT can benefit from it because you know, I've talked to CIOs before, I go talk to the line of business and I'm talking to them about improving their data quality and the impact that it'll have on their business process. And they're going to say four million and they go, well, what do I need to do? And I say, well, here's how we're going to get there. Here's the roadmap. And that CIO is running around going, this is great. I got some money. Woohoo! I could do something, right? So they kind of like it. But this tool, I mean, I would never put that in the hand of an ETL developer. 
because he wouldn't know what to do with a tool like that. But I have tools for ETL developers. So not only do we have the financial analysis tool, but we also have a tool called Data Quality Advisor, which is a best of breed tool that nobody else has. And what this allows us to do is assess the data in the sources and the target systems, right? We can profile that data. And again, this is a data steward, right? This is the business user here, right? Here's the developer, he's doing data services. Here's our ETL guy, right? So they could look at all this data quality problems that they have from profiling that data, assess where the problems are, leveraging that tool, understand where I need to focus from a financial perspective, right? From the previous piece of the puzzle. And then we have a data quality advisor piece based on rules that they have within their business from their information governance program, right? Matching, validation, cleansing rules. We can then help them tune that data, make suggestions, give advice on what needs to be done to the developer. And these two tools are integrated so our business data governance tool is integrated with our data services ETL based tool or ELT as we move into the next version. Nobody else does this in the market. This is best of breed. So now you understand when I tell you I can walk in and talk about information stewardship to a business user and they're ready to write a check. Because the way the process typically works is we have a data quality problem. Let's take a look at that with our ETL guys and see if they can transform it, clean up some of the data after they profiled it, do some enrichment, and then give us the data back for us to do our analytics and process and transaction processing, right? But now we've changed the game. We've turned it around. We've said, business, you own the data will help give advice to the developers based on your rules. So the other th big piece of the puzzle becomes, I have all these different systems, I have all these different data quality problems, I gotta create a best record, how do I do that? Well, we give a tool, again, to the business and IT, right, predominantly to the business, that allows them to see all the different conflicting data. So let me give you an example, right? You might have Claudia, well, here, here's the name right here. So here we have four records. I don't know if those of you can see it on the screen. Is it big enough for them to see it on the screen? All right. We have four records of a person by the name of Mary Nell Ford. In some systems, she's represented by her middle name, Kathy Ford. In other systems, she's Kathy is spelled Kathy Ford with a C and an IE, and in other systems, it's just Mary Ford. Now, notice, we didn't just look at the first name and the last name to determine what's the best record. If you notice, you have a fuzzy search, and all of them have very similar addresses. So we're starting to put that together. They have the same phone number, right? They're in four different ERP sources, four different SAP ERP instances. Some customers have 116, right? Seriously, right? So what can we do with this? Well, let's say that Mary Nell Ford is the head of procurement. So I could go to my procurement department or not my procurement department, she's head of procurement, I can go to my sales department and say, hey, which one of these records is right if I'm an IT guy? So I got a call, schedule, let's go figure it out and create it for her. But what if I could get that information into the hands of the data steward responsible for sales? Then that data steward who knows Mary Ford or Kathy or whatever name she goes by. Oh yeah, this is the right information. Let's click the fields that we want, all those with green dots, and that becomes our best record. That then gets pushed back into the data warehouse? Yes. That then gets integrated, syndicated is the word we use, 
can well, be syndicated out. Operations, so data this, warehouse everywhere. Yeah. So in this, it would be syndicated to the ERP sources. So a, a, qu a question about that. <clears throat> if you're creating this master data repository, why do you need to push it out to these various other databases? Why don't you just point the, this the apps to This is creating a best record. Don't, do you save it there? It can go into a master data repository. And then you don't need it in the operational system you or know, the you, data warehouse or could, anywhere else. You, you absolutely want to syndicate it back to all your source systems. Why? Why not just point them to this source? You can point them to the source to pull. But you, right? do you, see but what you I'm have saying, different though? data models in uh, those sources. Yeah, possibly. Right? Yeah. And so what you have to be able to It'd do. It'd be nice if you stored it in one place so it's it all, couldn't yeah. be changed. But see, in look these at that salesforce.com example that I gave you earlier. Yeah. The bank is not going to change that CRM system. Yeah. Too bad. They should. Well, yeah. <laughs> and that's what I say about I, that. There, I can't I can't <laughs> disagree with that, right? <laughs> so but this just kind of shows you, you know, at a high available, our, it's a high availability environment, and it's also the ability to match and create a best record. And this best record becomes your master or your golden record. And then it can be used, you know, if you're using MDG, it'll be used continuously throughout all your ERP and SAP BW processing. And with MDG, you can actually syndicate that record out to all the source systems. But the challenge with that syndication is you will have to do an ETL if they have different data models. So For example, if the customer field is eight bytes versus the name, the first name field, let's say, is eight bytes versus 32 and things like that, you have to be able to transform. Yeah. So who picks the green dots? The data steward from the so business there is a, side. So a person goes in and manually and says, manually this, says is the, this is the best. Okay. to create that Got record, it. but it's the business. It's not the I, IT yeah, guy no, I get that. doing it and then going in and trying to validate it with the business mm -hmm. and then changing it again and then validating it. Got it. And this is a simple example, right? Yeah. Think about an IT guy trying to do MRO, you know, at a plant who has no idea what a bridge and stratton's, you know, 15 horsepower VAT engine is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. D yes, sir. D does that have permission sets on it? So yes, it's okay. uses the entire SAP security model. And then it has workflows associated with it, et cetera. Content management. We talked a lot about this, uh, increasing business productivity, the ability to integrate your content, your unstructured content with your business processes. And that's what ECM does for us. It also helps us with accurate financial reporting. One of the things we do is we have a solution called invoice management. Invoices are a huge problem for companies because they create invoices, right? A piece of paper, they ship that piece of paper out or they electronically send it out. That piece of paper comes back. How do I link that piece of paper, whether electronic and I sc or I scan it back in and create an electronic instance of it, to my business process for invoice processing. Well, if I can strip that data out and I can tie that into my transactional system, then I've tied that invoice to my procure to pay process. And customers love that. And not only can they do it, the way we do it is that comes in through a mail and you actually just simply drag and drop the mail file into the procure to pay process folder that you have in Outlook, for example. And it'll handle the integration with the business process. The other thing is document presentment. We talked a little bit about this. How do we personalize the documents that we deliver at target customers? Right? Isn't it nice if I could personalize a document that says, Dear Ken, you're a business partner with us. You have your company, and we want to give you these promotions because you're such a great customer of ours. But we have to be able to do the analytics around that in order to drive that piece of the puzzle.
So now I got to be able to analyze, come up with my target customer base to drive that promotion to. And then I got to create that content to send out in a mail document that is personalized for a campaign. Is that better than sending out 100,000 credit card applications to say, hey, we're Discover, we got a credit card just for you. And you go, I already have a Discover card, <laughs> right? The other thing about content is our ability to eliminate content in the different silos and join it. So you have your business applications with your current analytical master and transactional data. Now, what if I can integrate my GIS, my location, my geocoding data, my address data, right, into that as well? What if I can take it even a step further, right? What if I can take my engineering documents that are 3D, integrate those into my MRO process, right? Maintenance, repair, and overhaul. So I know what this exact product number is from this vendor that's part of this complex for Lang's example. So I'm looking at a smart grid, right? Which is made up of a gazillion different assets and I need to repair those assets. What do I do where and when? What if I can put my user documentation tied to that MRO process? Well, we can do that for you. It's not a what if, we can do that. Spatial data, right? Visualize everything. I'll let you guys look at this picture. I can go through it. So we bring that, all the data, all the different sources, regardless of whether it's spatial data, real-time data, any business data that's hanging around, historical, right? Bring it into SAP HANA and create different visualizations, whether it's analytic, whether it's application, right? Whether it's GIS data. So I know that, hey, at this location, cable companies love this, right? Why would they love that? Any idea why a cable company would love that GIS type of data to know what households in an area have their service, right? So then they can analyze that GIS and spatial data to determine what? Okay, well, I got 80% coverage there, I'm good. But hey, I only got 30% coverage over here. Is there any promotions that I can run targeted at that zip code? Make sense? And then mobile. We all like this. We just use some of that today, right? How do I get from here to the airport? <laughs> and that's pretty much I think the last thing, oh, I was going to go through the vision and roadmap, but we don't have time. But what I do want to do is let you know a couple of things about IM. We have 11,000, over 11,000 customers. Our customers have won awards given by Gartner, for example, other analyst firms. We have a 90% customer sat rate. We're number two in market share. We're the fastest growing in market share. And we are a leader in a lot of the quadrants from Forrester, Gartner, uh, even when you look at the industry cart uh, and banking industry, we're number one. So we wrote a book. I was going to bring a book, but I ran out. I gave them all away <laughs> last week. Uh, but if you want a book, you can order one from SAP. It's all about EIM. It was written not by just SAP, but six of our customers wrote this with us. So we have actual customer use cases in here. The other thing, for those of you, uh, this is a look at what our iTunes app looks like in our PDF file, right? So you can go to iTunes and you can download uh, SAP for IM. And you can watch videos, you can see product descriptions, you can hear customer testimonials, you can look at use cases. So if you want to, you know, we have a whole area on harnessing big data. Then we have all their customer testimonials. Here you see master data management. We have another section on accurate analytics and big data, right? But ultimately to come back, remember the number one thing we want to walk away with 
is that in order to do analytics, you have to do it with trusted and relevant data. And there's so much data out there today that's not relevant. And how do you determine what, determine what data is relevant and what data isn't? And with some of the tools that we bring to the table and some of the processes that we help you with in the table, or we bring to the table, you can then do your job more efficiently because instead of as an analyst spending all of your time trying to get the data and sort it out, which is 80% of an analyst's time, right, and 20% actually doing the analytics, you can spend 80% of your time actually doing the analytics and bringing value to those key decision makers and 20% of your time validating the data as a business user. Any questions? I mean, did this help you guys? I know it's, this is like the level one, zero, high level overview. Uh, I think, well, first of all, you guys, uh, a lot of what you showed us, very interesting, very broad. Uh, you have certainly been on a on an acquisition spree to put it all together, and I think you've done a good job of showing us the the full end to end piece of it. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Manny, and that is, in reality, how integrated is all of this? Uh, from our from the IM piece of the puzzle, it's extremely integrated. Uh, we've done a we've had huge efforts around yeah. development working with our solutions teams working back with development to bring it all together recently i'll give you an example we had power designer which is a Siamese product we had information steward which is a sap product uh, power designer and information steward are now totally integrated so you got your architecture your modeling your metadata you know from a enterprise architecture perspective now lined up with through. information steward your business tool mm -hmm. so your business glossary your data quality and all that now come together uh, information steward is tightly integrated with our master data management tool as well as our data integration tool data services right so all those components are tightly integrated not only that, but when you look at HANA and this big database engine, right, we have all this data in HANA, but what happens to the data when I no longer need it? I have to archive it off, right? So it archives it off into IQ, and IQ and our ILM products are tightly integrated. OpenText, a vendor product, is integrated with ILM for all the archiving and retention management, right, as well as some of our business processes like their invoice management and our content management tools to pull it all together. Nice. So we have a very nice. tightly integrated, and that's one of the things, I don't have, didn't put that slide in there, but we are one of the very few vendors who Samsung, for example, told us point blank, you are the only vendor that we know that has integrated products from architect to archive, the complete life cycle of data. Did that answer your question? The key question that you didn't ask me that I was waiting on is very similar to what you asked Manny, is you have these tools, but how do you make sure the right person is using the right tool, right? Yeah, well, and, and that's I, I, key. I have like, a question in yeah. here in my script about what are the roles and how do you exactly. basically manage them. So I have a whole presentation on that <laughs> so, around data governance. But thanks for having me here, everyone. I appreciate it. Uh, if you have any questions, I live here in Arvada, just down the road. Uh, thanks for having me. I greatly appreciate it. All righty. Um, let's, yeah, excellent. Let's, let's uh, open it up for questions and see if there are questions either for Manny or for um, Ken. I have a question, actually. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. I, hello. Yeah. yeah. We, we, I have a question about um, the whole concept of ELT. In, in in memory engine, right? And I can conceptually understand what we're doing, but one of the if we have everything in an in memory engine, there's only one copy of the data, and generally in data warehousing, prior to any analytics, we need to keep a copy of source data somewhere. So is there not a risk 
of data being lost or the lineage of that data being lost under the ELT situation and if not, well, how is it combated then? How do you how do you know that what values have been changed within the system? Um, surely someone's got to be responsible for that somewhere in the line. Right. Um, so two, that's almost two different questions. So one is the question on uh, if you're doing extract, load, and then transform, you know, what is the data lineage? Who touched what data when? And that's part of our data services. We didn't get into that detail of all what's in data services and how it works, but we can know who touched what data, when it was modified, and who modified it as part of our data lineage components and data services. The next question is about how do we know if the data is lost? So um, that's a good question because in ELT, it, you're actually staging the data. You're still staging it just like you are with ETL. You're just staging it in memory. And in, in Oracle, they don't, even, they don't even do it in memory. They do it in disk cache, right? So, so what uh, happens if the power goes out? <laughs> well, that's, it's just, that's where I was going. So yeah. it's all based on your high availability environment. Yeah. Right. So do you have a, a backup somewhere that you're constantly... Uh, oh, yeah. So the HANA hot? is a high availability environment. That's what the H and A stand for. Okay. Right. So you're actually better off because now you're not having to have like a HACMP type of environment that's separate for your databases. Right, it's all part of that high availability environment. But but I'm assuming you're writing back out of that memory on some schedule. I.e., if I've got a session open and I'm doing ELT, right, in memory, and let's say I've got an hour session engaged and uh, lights go out at 55 minutes, would it have written to some backup store? prior to 55 minutes, can I set that or no? That's I don't know backed about up. how I set that up in HANA. I'm not a HANA configuration guy, to be honest. Do you know that answer at all? I'd have to think about it. Yeah, I mean, I know it's high availability, so they have to probably be able to produce it somewhere else in memory or you know, put it into a different instance somewhere. So. So data loss, I hope I answered the question by saying... Well, I think, I think the problem is with data loss is, yes, you've got a backup, but then you've got, when it comes back when up, you then back? have to reload have? the memory, which is yeah. a pretty significant time suck. <laughs> it could think. be, yeah. Well, exactly. you were talking about big data. It's going to be a, exactly. it's gonna take a while exactly. to load it all back into memory. I mean, there's yeah. no perfect solution. There's exactly. nothing that is, you know, whatever. <clears throat> anyway, uh, my thanks to you guys very much for uh, for coming out, especially flying all the way out. I really appreciate it. This was a this was a very good session, um, very interesting one, very different between the two. So I'm glad you both were able to come out because it would have been sad to just focus on one area and not focus on the other because you do have a deep breadth of of technologies and and uh, capabilities. So until next time, uh, my thanks to Ken and to Manny, a very, a very broad set of technologies. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, those of you on the phone. As always, thanks to my new members. And, uh, and thanks to you guys for coming all the way out here. Good job. And thank you for oh, having us. Absolutely. We greatly appreciate it. Absolutely. Appreciate it.